Hi and welcome to my new episode. Today, my guest is a true legend already in her lifetime. She is a multiple Grammy Award winner. She is a TED Talk speaker and she has been given more than 100 awards internationally, but this is just the icing on the cake. The real thing is that she was bringing a new paradigm of listening to the world. She lost her hearing when she was about eight, and instead of quitting music, she embarked on a career the first person ever who made a full-time solo percussion career in the world. It's a true honor to have her on my podcast today. Welcome, Evelyn Glenny. Welcome to The Power of Rhythm, a podcast with your host, Reinhard Flatischler, around the one thing that connects us all. Rhythm. Listening is so much broader than just music. If I'm listening to you with my heart and with my body, I need to be empty, not in my thoughts, and I need to be still. And maybe music is a perfect way to learn that ability, especially the way you listen to Yes, I mean, I, I feel that uh, in order to build the listening bridges in a way, um, it, it's, it's for me all about presence. It's just literally being there and presence means being engaged. So if you're having a conversation with someone, for example, I'm speaking with you right now, and you are the most important person in my life right now. This is, you know, the 100% activity that I want to be engaged with at this point in time. And, and that's really, really important. Otherwise, we'll lose so many layers of the onion in the experience of that engagement. And with the experience builds the story of someone. And, and we all have a story to tell. So I don't think listening is about putting it into some sort of method or, um, you know, oh, this is how you do it. Um, there's no how to really about it. It's just simply being present and then making the decision as to whether you want to be um, engaged with that. So it, it, it's something that in a way we can all do any moment of the day, should we choose to. Um, if we don't need a special room, we don't need special acoustics, we don't need special equipment, we don't need anything other than ourselves and making that decision. What I found when I was watching your performance is that you move very different to any other musician I have seen. And, you know, with my Megadrums project, I've played with Ayir Tosaki and all these great people. But you are music. Like, uh, it seems like your hearing makes you so acute in your movements that there is no separation between you and the music. Well, I, I think perhaps, um, I don't know why that's the case, but I do remember uh, when I started percussion, timpani and percussion from the age of 12 at school, um, there were very few tutor books, method books, exercise books, and it, you know, being brought up in the northeast part of Scotland uh, in a farming community, you know, we only had one music store um, in the nearest city, which was Aberdeen, and that store really sold pianos and um, organs that people bought for their homes in those days. And so percussion was just non-existent as, as far as instruments and mallets and, and books and things like that, um, certainly in Scotland at that time. And, uh, and it meant that um, my teacher, he would... Uh, take a piece of Bach or Chopin or some ragtime music by Scott Joplin or Scottish traditional music and so on. And he would ask us to look at that, maybe a phrase from that particular piece of music. And then he would ask us to think about um, the, the key signature of that piece of music. So let's say it was in G minor or E major or whatever it might be. And then he would ask us to look at the rhythm of that, the tempo of that, um, the dynamics of that, 
the feel of that, the texture, and all of the musical ingredients so inherent with any instrument that we play. And so let's say we took a, a, a piece of Bach, a Bach partita or something, and it went and it went on and on like that. So if you dissect the rhythm, you would simply get and it would go on and on forever throughout most of the piece. However, when he said, think about the feel of the key signature, so let's say G minor, so it's a slightly kind of, you know, darker key, but it's not a threatening minor key, you know, it's something that still could be very easily major, it's still something that's approachable, it's not a rich key like a B minor or an A flat minor or something like that, you know, so it's quite an open key, it's sort of a welcoming minor key, and all of this kind of thing. And so we would translate that piece onto our snare drum. And with that, we ended up, you know, using all sorts of ways and, and angles of the sticks in order to get the feel of the G minor and the feel of the different colors of the ebbs and flows of the phrases that we saw. So all of this was dealing with sight reading. It was dealing with general musicianship. It was dealing with our natural physicality through the instrument and so on. Now, he could have said, right, Evelyn, this is a snare drum. Please hold the sticks like this. Please make sure your feet are this apart or whatever. Your arms are at a more or less 90 degree angle, etc., etc." So you'd have to try and remember all of these things. And then you would strike the drum and ask for permission, you know, is that right or wrong? So thankfully, my teacher was so open by actually having less materials, you know, less percussion materials, but a lot more musical materials. And so I've always sort of struggled, I suppose, with the feeling that with percussion, people see rhythm as the most important thing. I think that all of the musical elements are important and when we think of rhythm we're still dealing with resonance we're still dealing with texture we're still dealing with color and so on and so forth you know when we deal with texture there is rhythm in texture you know there's all sorts of things and that resonance that goes on so i feel that all of the musical ingredients like our senses are completely and utterly linked and move like a kaleidoscope you know, listening is such an important element in our lives. And if you look around at the world now, so many people are just talking, talking, but no one is really listening. And I think this is a, a subject that goes way beyond just music. But music is such a beautiful uh, test ground to how we can listen. Your way of performing is based on listening because your movements are so different than any other musicians I've ever heard. So you are music as you move. And uh, I'm so happy that we can play a little bit of your uh, features. Now, this time I'll have um, Michael Doughty, the uh, Dream Machine. And it's the beginning uh, where you play really like you would be dancing.
Evelyn Glenny performing on the marimba in extreme movements like dancing to this music. This is so incredible. When I saw it first time, I was like, wow. Now, we also share some uh, passion, which is collecting instruments. <laughs> I do this as well. You have a much bigger collection. So what... Is the meaning for you to have all these little entities around you, like you can see in the background here? Absolutely. Well, I think that once I started percussion from the age of 12, that uh, and when my teacher asked me one week to uh, perhaps try to purchase a pair of drumsticks and then a week or two later a pair of xylophone sticks, a week or two later a pair of timpani sticks and so on, I knew that I would be a collector of something. And uh, and it's not long before you build up a you know a collection of mallets and and sticks and then small auxiliary instruments such as triangle and tambourine and castanets and so on, and uh, and I think you then get the bug <laughs> of of uh, wanting to uh, increase the collection. But I think for me it was once I started traveling around uh, the world to different territories that I realized the scope of percussion. And of course you were often meeting the instrument makers as well. And that was fascinating. And I remember going to the apartment of uh, a drum maker in Venezuela, uh, Caracas in Venezuela. And he lived in a really tiny, tiny apartment. But there he was in his living room, you know, making these extraordinary, beautiful, long Venezuelan drums. And that was quite special to meet his family, to see how he was making these drums. And then, of course, in those days, you were able to, to just sort of put them on the plane back, back home again. And it's not quite so easy to do that nowadays. So but it's fascinating how global percussion is and how sociable it is. It can be shared with all demographics, all people from all backgrounds, all ages, all situations. It is absolutely the most approachable family of instruments. Now, you also said that your favorite instrument is the snare drum. And uh, when I uh, listened to your story, your teacher as you were in your first class, he took away your sticks and said like, explore the drum, just don't, just watch it, touch it. Was it your first drum? Yes, it was indeed my first drum and he didn't even give me a stand for it. So it was literally the drum that I walked home with. And, uh, and so yes, maybe that contributed to uh, the fact that it, it's, it's one of the instruments that I probably play most days one way or another and uh, but i think the snare drum you know the shape of the snare drum it's round it's compact it can be handheld it can be put in a stand it can be put on different surfaces and it, you know you it's also an instrument that you imagine more or less one general sound to come from it i.e you know a short sound either with the snares on or with the snares off but actually, once you do peel away the onions, uh, you know, of that snare drum, it becomes this fascinating instrument that not only orally is interesting, but physically is interesting. And when you think of all the different ways of playing a snare drum, um, the traditional ways, whether it's the American, the Irish, the Scots, the Basel style of playing, and so on and so forth, um, the orchestral way of playing, the, the, the more military side, um, the hist history of the snare drum. It's really a, a fascinating instrument. But I just like the fact that it's so compact and it uses so many different techniques that you don't necessarily transfer to so, so many other instruments. All right. Now, I have a little uh, clip here from you playing uh, the snare drum. Uh, also in the same um, composition. And I've never seen someone playing snare drum like this. So let's hear a little uh, uh, clip of that, please.
so amazing what someone can do on a <laughs> snare drum, <laughs> really. <laughs> and uh, th there's another common thing we have. Uh, actually, I found that you have a movie about Korea. I've been three years in Korea uh, learning uh, from... Not you know you met Kim Dok Su who is the founder of Samuel Nori but uh, I learned also with uh, Kim Sok Chul who is a real living shaman and yeah so uh, I, I learned the Chang or the Ching the Grang or the book and uh, it's a fascinating place I I must say and and that was certainly my first time in South Korea um, oh this was so many years ago I think back in the 1990s and it was for a BBC uh, series of programs where different people went to different parts of the world. And, and so I had this opportunity and, and it was just uh, really one of the most extraordinary trips. And of course, musically, um, for which the documentary was about exploring the traditional music of, of South Korea. It was absolutely fascinating. Yes, and you went to all the places that are really the you know epicenters, like Pulguksa. I was meditating there for a long time. I was learning the big uh, um, babko. They call it babko, like the daiko, you know. Uh, in that you have also in the when you see the monks playing like a butterfly, right? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, wonderful. What what did you take from this time? Did you ever uh, pursue Django for a longer time or? No, not really. Um, I think uh, what what I'm inclined to do is if I do come across a, an instrument uh, perhaps that I'm not familiar with, and certainly the, the Korean instruments I was not familiar with at the time, but then once I, I have them home, as it were, I then begin to just experiment uh, myself, so with different sort of techniques, different mallets, different ways, um, because I'm very aware that in order to learn the traditional ways of playing uh, so many percussion instruments is that you do need to devote um, a, a large part of time and actually be in the territory um, where that instrument is from and, and really, you know, like listening, surround yourself and steep yourself in that tradition. and. To be honest, my my journey, you know, as a performing musician has not allowed that amount of time uh, in the schedule. So I think that a lot of the things that I do when I'm approaching instruments is almost like a child seeing an instrument for the first time. So there are no rules, there are no regulations or methods, and you just instinctively do what you feel you want to do with it. And it could be completely absurd, and that's fine. Um, but nevertheless, a lot of those things are actually very useful when you come to uh, composing music for media, such as films or television and radio and so on, because it's all about atmosphere and sound and, and just things that you wouldn't necessarily do on a concert platform. Right. And I'm so fascinated when I see you playing, like uh, there's a video about you playing the cajon in a very, you know, uh, unusual way with sticks and with all. But, you know, this is all based on something so important for humanity, which is curiosity. I always see you curious. And if we would approach life curious every day, <laughs> everything would change in the world. It, it's so true. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, there are extraordinary people out there who do extraordinary things on percussion. And ultimately, you know, you just cannot be uh, a master of everything at all. And that's not why, why I want to be a percussion player, why I want to be a musician. I simply, you know, I'm curious towards sound. And it just so happens that my ingredients happen to be percussion instruments. And therefore, you know, I have to follow the kind of instinctive, as you say, curiosity and also physically what I have to play with. You know, I'm five foot two. So if I'm playing something on the marimba that has a massive stretch or on multi percussion that has a massive stretch, and I know in my mind the, the type of sound I would like to achieve, but because 
the body is not long enough. It, it's not about more hours of practice. That won't solve the situation. So it's all about also listening to the machine that we have at play. So I have this shape of hands or this length of arms and so on. So everything I do has to absolutely feed through the natural kind of mechanism of the, the physical body. And it's just so important to bring technique to your body and not try to force your body into a technique. Otherwise, you'll always come across a brick wall somewhere along the line. And, and this is why we get sometimes confused as about, well, you must practice this more and more and more. Of course we have to practice and of course we have to rehearse and imagine and visualize. But ultimately, it, it absolutely starts with being completely at home with what you have available physically. That's such an important message for everyone who teaches music on the whole music university. So they should really embrace that kind of attitude because there's so many people just, you know, trying to get better by getting more, you know, of course, as, as you said, you have to practice. But uh, I have another thing that I found from you. There are two steel barrels. And you look like an explorer somewhere in the ocean uh, trying to, what is coming out of that? So I want to just play a little part that the people understand what we're talking about, okay? Evelyn Glenny exploring life through sound, through rhythm. That's so fascinating. Now, what would you say, uh, what is the advantage for an average person who is, let, let's say, an engineer or whatever, to engage active, actively in rhythm and sound? Would you say everyone should try this approach? Yes, I mean, it's it's interesting because we actually do it every single day of our lives, you know, as soon as we, um, you, you know, are aware of our, our breathing, um, then that is a rhythmic force. The, the natural progression of a day has its rhythm, the night, our dream patterns and so on. You know, we're, we are rhythm, actually, so we don't have to find it. We are absolutely the, you know, a rhythmic force in, in the universe. And... Uh, but again, it's how often we define these things that oh, rhythm only belongs to music um, or rhythm only belongs to a machine that's working well. Um, so we always imagine rhythm to, to you know, be dissected in this kind of way. But really, rhythm is the most natural thing that we can engage with. And it's often once we stand still or sit still and just be with our own internal thoughts that actually we are very aware suddenly of our natural rhythm, you know. And this is why John Cage's 4 minutes 33 seconds is, is such an extraordinary piece of music, um, because suddenly it catapults us all. We're thrown up in the air with our own individual rhythm, so we're not now collectively, you know, being coerced by a wonderful melody, you know, in B flat major or something. It this is literally, you know, oh, uh, 
and that's why we get such a reaction to that piece you know it can throw us completely and it's absolutely fascinating and so I do feel that you know as you mentioned earlier the world is a really noisy place it's a noisy place as far as all of our senses are concerned you know we have a lot of oral noise we have, have a lot of visual noise a lot of movement we have a lot of um, you know noise that we can taste we, there's a lot of noise we can smell a lot of noise we can touch and it's slightly overloaded and so we begin not to have the patience to just want to engage with something or someone and uh, so really our rhythm all has to start from internally and as I said before we don't need anything special to do that it's just literally an awareness of getting this in moderation within our, our daily lives I actually find that I spend a lot of my evenings just sitting looking out a window even if it's dark outside you know I literally just look out the window and I don't think about anything in particular it's just whatever comes into my mind at that point of, at point in time and it could be that I'm standing or sitting there for maybe an hour two hours I mean but it's the most precious time I don't put it in my diary so it's something that I don't say you must do this you know it it's if I feel like doing it I do and it really happens most days even if I'm in a hotel room or something that time is absolutely essential it doesn't have have to happen in the evening but it seems to me that naturally that's when I just sort of decide to put everything else aside in the day and that's the time that I'm just with me in the world really Wonderful. It's like uh, getting out of this compulsive thinking that uh, logs in, you know, over the day yes. or emotional reactivity, becoming empty, becoming in this emptiness where everything is in this emptiness, <laughs> which is the miracle of life, actually. It, it, it's true. And I think actually that has a bearing then on when you approach an instrument or an object you know you kind of see it as an open you know a, a clean slate an open source of right you know what can be done here and all of the sounds really it, you want to feel as though they're like a world premiere you know as though you're you're a, a metal detector of sound and you're suddenly oh wow you know but of course that sound already exists you're not actually inventing a sound so that metal barrel is already there in front of me the sound is in the, the metal barrel and it's just up to us to try to detect where those sounds are wonderful now uh, what is the next project if you look in the future that's dearest to your heart well, that's that's an, a really interesting question because I think that um, so many things have naturally changed over time, which happens as a as a performer and as a musician and as a uh, anyone in in any kind of profession. And that again is all about listening. And of course, the the global pandemic that we're navigating through has also. Uh, changed aspects of the rhythm, I would say, of, of a, a career and what you decide you want to do. But I think for me, um, the, the next steps, as it were, is all about uh, bringing the whole journey together. So mm. I'm working towards the Evan Rennie collection, and this is bringing, you know, absolutely everything that we have historically done to this point, and that includes the instruments, the uh, photographs, the clothes, the music scores, the um, concert programs, um, the correspondence, all sorts of things, everything, so that we can build a story um, of, of each mm -hmm. element. So a tiny example is that when James McMillan wrote his now very famous percussion concerto, Veni Veni Emmanuel, mm -hmm. and it's now the most performed percussion concerto in the world, that when that was written, he wanted to use six bass tubular bells or chimes at the end of the piece. Now, a lot of the higher companies, the percussion hire companies, did not have those specific bells. Mm. So this meant that, you know, as a performer, you worked with the higher companies. And then, of course, I needed the bells for, for myself, you know, in order to travel around um, to play the piece myself. 
So the story of those bells, you know, are related to that particular piece of music. And, uh, and then you can begin to show the score, you can begin to show the instruments, what was worn at the premiere, and the broadcast, the recording, the reviews, the program, the previews, etc, etc. And uh, so it all just stems from those bells. Or you could approach the piece from another instrument that was used. And um, so really it's making sure that the collection is absolutely accessible to musicians and non-musicians, so that it's not just about percussion or about music, but it's also incorporating the spine that runs through it, which is listening. And what's about conveying your deep experience, your revelation, your wisdom to the younger generation? Are you in for that, like teaching? Well, it's it's so interesting because I think that the the virtual means that we have in order to communicate with each other allows a very open platform to happen. And so, you know, we find that we want to be approachable to all sorts of people um, who can or who feel they can approach us. So that can be primary school children, so really young children, it can be preschool children, it can be children with um, hearing challenges, it, it can be children um, with all sorts of different challenges, it can be to adults, it can be to school teachers, it can be to business people, sports or, uh, people and so on and so forth. So rather than me feeling as though I need to teach some somebody something, you know, I feel slightly uncomfortable with that. But I do feel comfortable in saying, look, the door is open here. And, you know, if you want to come through this door, then together, you know, we can relate to what is absolutely appropriate to your particular circumstances. And I think that's what listening is about. I know, for example, some of the repertoire I played when I was a much younger musician absolutely felt right at the time. And now when I try to play it, it doesn't feel right. And some of the repertoire I tried to play as a younger musician didn't feel right. And now when I play it, it actually does feel a bit better. So again, why is this? And, and you know, I think it's the same with, with people when we engage with people. I don't want to bring a system or a method to people and expect it to work. But I want people to come to us and, and for us to also go to them and ask the question, what is it? So all of our consultations are bespoke. It's very important for us to know what is the story of that person and therefore am I the right person to be engaging with? And so it's it's a really open kind of discussion that we, we then have and a, and a session that we have. Beautiful approach. Thank you for sharing yes. that. I want to close with another wonderful quote of yours, which is, society cannot continue to disable themselves through their needs to categorize people or make assumptions as to their another individual abilities. So that's so wonderful because now that's what's happening so much. People, you know, go on each other and get more and more divided. Absolutely. It, it's, oh, you know, and it's, it, it's interesting how when we... Um, explore new platforms so perhaps the newest platforms are social media and so we all have a voice we all have the same kind of platform that we can express ourselves through mm. and with all of those wonderful things that can happen through social media there's also the yin and yang kind of effect where well there's there's a lot of negative things that can come through as well and it's always i'm a great believer if i believe in anything is about moderation it really is about moderation. So you can enjoy as much as you can enjoy, but it's about moderation. And I think it's the same when we physically play, you know, and, and you described something so so beautifully earlier where you mentioned, you know, a, a big drum, you know, that, that you experienced in, in, in South Korea, and but yet it can be played like a butterfly. And we have this image of a great big drum and you feel so, oh, you need to be really strong and powerful and need big muscles and all of that sort of thing. The two seems to go together. But when we think about the opposites, it's amazing then how things can open. And it's always trying to see underneath that surface as to what actually is there. 
and we're often so reactive to things, very reactive, very quick to decide on something. And you know, as a musician as well, we need time, we need patience. You know, we spend hours and hours and hours, you know, linking one note to another note or one sound to another sound, and 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 just let that fester for a little while, and then you know, we we try something else. And when we meet somebody or try to understand the story, this isn't a first date. You know, we need many dates in order to 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 really you know begin to know that person. So. And every day we have an opportunity to do that. Yeah. So every day is like a world premiere. <laughs> <That's so laughs> <good expression. Yeah. laughs> so Evelyn, I thank you so much for taking your time, coming on my podcast, and just tell our listeners briefly, where can they check you out? Well, um, I have a, a website. And that is www.evelyn.co.uk. And then from there, you will see the various social media. Um, and feel free to contact us. I have a very small team, very dedicated, very approachable, very lovely team. And they would be more than delighted to try and help in any way. And any messages that go to them can also come to me. So we're very well connected with each other and it would be absolutely lovely to hear from anybody. So I really meant what I said. It's a big honor to talk to you, having you know brought to the world what you have brought to the world. And so to my listeners, please check that really out. If you like the podcast, go to www.targetina.com forward slash podcast and leave a comment if you like it and for that you know uh, I wish you a pleasant day and keep on grooving